on Radio EcoShock. The nuclear accident at Fukushima, Japan, is far from over. Three reactors continue to melt down, and now there is a storm of international worry about nuclear fuel ponds tottering in blown-up buildings. The whole northern hemisphere is at risk right now. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. We are joined again by nuclear industry expert Arnold Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. Arnie Gunderson, a year ago you warned us right here on Radio EcoShock and to anybody else who would listen that a world-scale catastrophe was lurking in the nuclear fuel storage ponds of both reactors 3 and 4 at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan. Why do you think this story is finally getting wider attention now, a year later? Well, I think, you know, the drama of seeing units explode and the talk of meltdown has finally subsided and... um, that allows what little press there is that's covering it to move on to what, what's, in fact, the, the much bigger story, and that's the, the condition of the fuel in Unit 4's fuel pool. And, and I'm glad you mentioned it in the lead-in there that Unit 3's fuel pool uh, should also be a concern to policymakers. This Mark I design is so fragile, and everybody was focused on what's inside the containment but we're at a point now where we really have to worry about what's outside the containment. Yeah, well, let me just read a couple things into the record here. The Japanese press, which has been following the government line up till now, is starting to break out. On April 2nd, Takao Yamada, expert senior writer for Manichi paper, said, quote, The seven-story building itself has suffered great damage, and with the storage pool barely intact on the building's third and fourth floors, the roof has been blown away. If the storage pool breaks and runs dry, the nuclear fuel inside will overheat and explode, causing a massive amount of radioactive substances to be spread over a wide area. And we also had the unusual case of Japan's former ambassador to Switzerland, Matsui Murata, speaking out at a public hearing of the Budgetary Committee on March 22, 2012, and he told the Swiss if Reactor 4 fuel pool collapses, the cooling water for all six reactors could be shut down, as well as for a nearby spent fuel pool with another 6,000 rods. And then finally, Arnie, we have Japanese diplomat Akio Matsumura. He's blogging about this publicly. It's very surprising Japanese officials are speaking out. Why now? Do they know something we don't? Well, I've been working with Takio Matsumura now for more than a year on this problem, and I have to give him a lot of credit. He has been persistent and single-focused on the issue of these fuel pools. But Gordon Edwards in Canada and I have been um, talking to Ambassador Matsumura frequently on the fuel pool issue. I'd like to think that the book we wrote has a little impact on this as well. They call it the kimono band. The colored band around the book in Japanese only says the quote that they lifted from the book is that if Unit 4 collapses, you're going to have to evacuate Tokyo. But but that's not news. It's a new book. But I think, you know, the combination of Ambassador Matsumura's work for a long time now, basically a year, that the book out there... And also, you know, what amazes me is the frequency of earthquakes in Japan has been dramatically higher, actually leading up to the big 9.0. For about three or four months before that, there was a dramatic increase in the 4s and the 5s and the 6s in Japan. Something has shifted in the plates off of the coast of Japan. You know, I have friends in Tokyo, and they're saying there's noticeably more significant tremblers in Tokyo than there were Oh, back in 2010. That combination is forcing people to realize that Fukushima is not going to go away anywhere anytime soon. Well, now, what, what is the book? Tell us about that. It's published by Shueisha. It's available in Japanese only on um, Amazon.jp. Maggie and I were interviewed by a woman journalist who then took that long interview, five, six days of interview, and put them in a book back in October, which then got published in February, and I was in Japan speaking to the Japanese press club. But it's entitled Fukushima Daiichi, uh, The Truth and the Way Forward. I think it's important that the Japanese understand that there are alternatives to nuclear going forward that Tokyo Electric really doesn't want them to understand. 
And you raised this thing about more earthquakes, and I found some research in a paper. It's in a journal called Solid Earth. It's a journal of the European Geosciences Union, and it's by Da Peng Zhao, who is a geophysics professor at Japan's Tohoku University. And he says that the giant earthquake of March 2011 has reactivated a seismic fault closer to the Fukushima nuclear plant, and using the latest scientific techniques and measurements, this paper warns another big quake could strike even closer to the plant. And and one blog, Washington's blog, which is a pretty good blog, it says, scientists say there is a 70% chance of a magnitude 7 earthquake hitting Fukushima this year and a 98% chance within the next three years. And you said in an interview with Dr. Helen Caldicott back in February that if they got another 7 quake, that could do it. That could bring the reactor 4 fuel pool down. Yeah, I, I think we give ourselves as a species more credit than we deserve because we look back and and at the historical record, but really, you know, we've only been analyzing this for a hundred years and trying to go back in the historical record, perhaps a thousand. But you're stuck with the situation of a high consequence event that you believed has been low probability. But, you know, now we've got these papers saying that we've got the significant likelihood of serious earthquakes and they're not low probability. So we've got the worst confluence. You know, you've got the, the high probability of rent combined with the high, the high seriousness. And uh, that's certainly a frightening place to be. And that's where Japan is right now. Well, it seems to me, and many Radio EcoShock listeners from all over the world have written me about this, that we're sleepwalking through a potential global catastrophe. And they want to know, why isn't there an international emergency action plan to save us from this? It's something that might make Chernobyl look small in comparison. Have you heard rumblings about that? What What are your thoughts? I have no information about any kind of a global concerted effort. You know, I, I know the Nuclear Regulatory Commission provides information, but the way the world community is structured on nuclear reactors There is no organization that pulls together a coordinated response. It might be a little different on nuclear bombs, but the nuclear reactors are very much seen as everybody's own domestic policy. You know, whether that's a developing country in the third world or a, a, a massive industrial country like Japan, it's basically been hands off. Each country has the right to monitor and improve or, or disassemble their own reactors. I don't understand that because, as you just said, we are looking at the possibility of a global calamity. But the way the international law is structured and also, frankly, um, trying to get the interest of the State Department and the president is an incredibly difficult process. You know, they they bounce along to the worst problem right now as opposed to really recognizing that there's a serious one just over the horizon. Well, we have social protests and actions on all sorts of things, even 9-11 and all sorts of things like that, but I'm not willing to just sit here and wait and see whether myself and my grandchild are are irradiated to see whether the Japanese do something. I'm I'm just not willing to wait for that. I I agree with you, and and, I've been talking to as many government officials as I can, but I really haven't sense that they have a fire lit on under them on this. I guess that's a bad analogy when we're talking about fuel pool fires. But I really don't sense that they have any uh, any burning desire to tackle the problem. You know, there, there's three ways you can tackle this problem. The first way is to gamble that the existing trolley is strong enough to put the spent fuel cask into the Unit 4 pool as it is. It seems like uh, I think Japanese officials are considering that as an alternative. The problem is that that particular trolley is weakened by the explosions and the fire, and uh, if you were to try it, it may fail, in which case it would puncture the floor of, of, of the spent fuel pool. The last thing in the world you want is, as you're moving fuel, is to drop a spent fuel canister through that floor because it will crack the floor, drain the pool, and cause the worst imaginable accident, which um, Brookhaven has estimated that uh, tens of thousands of people will die from cancers as a result of a fuel pool fire. So you don't want to go there. It's kind of obvious. So the second way would be to use those smaller cranes they have on site and develop a special canister that maybe would only move two or three pieces of fuel at a time 
but you got to get it off of that high floor and onto the ground. And the faster, the better. So that's sort of my proposed alternative. They already have another fuel storage spot on the site. So if you could get the fuel off that pool onto the ground and then into that other spent fuel storage pool, the problem is 95% mitigated. And the third alternative is to build a building around the building and then put a heavy-duty crane on that building and use that. The, the problem there is that, you know, like you said, the chance of a severe earthquake are significant over the next year or two. If you want to gamble that it won't happen, the best thing to do would be to build a building around the building and put a crane in there. But given the consequences, I think the middle alternative, especially design a really small cask that can take out two or three bundles at a time and get them on the ground and then put them into the existing pool. Oh, I know the one you mean. It's got about 6,000 fuel rods in it right now. Uh, And time is of the essence. We really don't want to wait five or ten years to pull this off. And Unit 3, you know, you started the the lead in on, on this whole piece by talking about Unit 3. Unit 3 is worse. It's mechanically, it's, a, it's rubble, the pool of rubble, and um, uh, it's got less fuel in it. But it faces the same problems. You know, structurally, the pool has been dramatically weakened, and God, nobody's even gotten near it yet. So um, we've got to get the fuel out of Unit 4 because that's where most of it is. And then you've got to move on to Unit 3 and pull the fuel from that pool just as quickly as you can. And you were an expert and, in fact, an an executive in a company that dealt with fuel rod assemblies, were you not? Yes. we. um, My division built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors just like Fukushima. Um, We built the fuel racks for Vermont Yankee, for instance. So, yes, I I understand the process. You know, the the problem is that it's called the heavy lift. The, The fuel can't be picked up and lifted through air and put down on the back of a pickup and then driven off. The, the fuel is so radioactive that if it becomes airborne, it's, you know, lethal doses within the 100 feet and perhaps even more than that. And, of course, if all the fuel were to become unshielded, if all the water were to drain away, uh, it's likely you'd have to evacuate a large portion of the site. So you really don't want that pool to become dry. After it becomes dry, it would also catch fire, and, and that's the worst case for the large population. But should it go dry, there's a period in between when it's so radioactive, it creates something called sky shine. The gamma rays from the fuel go up, bounce off air molecules, and come down. The, the fancy word is Compton scattering, but it would, um, it would irradiate the entire site to the point where you just couldn't move people around. Yeah, not a place you want to be. So that heavy lift has to be done perfectly. When you put the fuel into these large canisters, you can't drop the canister. Don't drop the canister. Oh, my, my, my. This is Radio EcoShock with former nuclear industry executive and expert witness Arnold Gunderson from Fairwinds.com. Arnie, before we get back to this ultimate threat, it seems to me, of nuclear fuel rods dangling in a very damaged building and two damaged buildings at Fukushima, Japan, I have to say the triple meltdown of the reactors operating at the time of the quake, that's not over either. What is the news about reactor number two, for example? Well, number two has, they were able to get a probe into the containment, not into the reactor, but into the containment. They had thought there would be 30 feet of water. In fact, there was only two feet of water. And you're counting on the water as shielding, and the radiation exposures were um, 7,000 R an hour which basically would kill you in 10 minutes. So so it's a radiation exposure that that would kill carbon-based life forms, and it's also so high that it'll wipe out robots pretty quickly, too. And that's the bad news is that the the numbers are so high, but that's the best unit. Unit 2 is the one that people can get closest to. Unit 1 and Unit 3 are even worse. So the, the question is, how are they ever going to get these cores cleaned up? Because it's coming from the radioactive cores. It, you know, we're at a point where we have to count on brand new science. There's nothing on the market and nothing foreseeable that's going to um, be able to go into these containments and knock those exposures down. The alternative is to wait 300 years because most of it is coming from cesium. And um, 300 years out, those numbers will drop down. But 